I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So today is Palm Sunday, and in part of our tradition, often called Sunday of the Passion. But to get to the Passion, it starts here with the triumphal entry. As we move through this week, we come to the Last Supper, and go to the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus, and continue on to his trial and crucifixion, and then through to the joy of the resurrection. So this week begins the most important week of the Christian year. Everything up to this point in what we have, hearing and have been hearing in Scripture is important and foundational. But again, this is the most important week for us as Christians. As we move through Holy Week, this is the highest point of our worship for the year, this sacred festival. And so whether you have heard the story for the first time or whether you have heard the story your entire life, there is so much to glean from the readings and from the teachings that we hear this week. It's hard to focus on just one thing. So the point that I'm trying to focus on this week is that Palm Sunday teaches us about humility. Humility in the face of the powers of this world that seek to control and dominate life. And the fact that humility in the face of those powers is ultimately more inspiring and liberating than anything else. The humility which Jesus exemplified teaches us about the kind of example that needs to be shown and lived. It is just as true in our world today as it was when Jesus was committing these actions and showing people this example. One of the key things, I think, from Jesus' example, as I was preparing for this week, I thought was best summed up in this line from our reading from the book from the prophet Isaiah this morning. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. The people that Jesus was teaching were weary. They were weary of an oppressive occupation of their lives in every way, politically, physically, and spiritually. They were weary of the Roman Empire that didn't treat them as human beings. They were weary of the poverty that they were living in where there was never enough for them or for their children. And they were weary of the religious hypocrites who ruled the only part of their lives that the Roman Empire didn't and told them that they were not good enough. Jesus' words and actions filled them with a the hope that things could be different for them and most importantly for their children. And so this week begins with Jesus taking this strange and yet awe-inspiring action that filled life-weary people with hope, and a hope that sustained them through some very dark days that were just around the corner. To start off this week, as they proclaim Jesus as King and Lord, that was in direct opposition and defiance to the rule of the Roman Empire. You hear in the Pharisees who called Jesus to stop them making this proclamation. Jesus returned proclamation that if they stopped, even the stones would cry out. As we move through the rest of Holy Week, that hope is built on for the disciples, for all of Jesus' followers, for any and all who had ears to hear and to listen. We often say that the same ones who were welcoming him into the city were the same ones who, days later, were calling for his crucifixion. don't know about you, but I find myself wondering about that, and about the complication of that, whether it was the exact same people. 
and that took me to a place to consider complicity. And so this is not, in a sense, to call into question our need to think about our actions in the world and how we, too, can be complicit in our actions with the powers of this world that seek to oppress others. Because contemplating that and digging into that can be overwhelming. And unless you are ready to face it, you might not want to dig too deep. Because it affects everything. From our financial investments and the institutions that we support, to the products that we buy. Because the derivative and trickle-down effect is that in various ways and places and what other people do with the money that we use, weapons are bought and conflict is fueled. Those same conflicts and the same weapons that produce the refugees who are so desperate to come to our shores. Because their homelands have been destroyed and are unsafe or the products that we use and so desperately want and think that we need rely on resources being mined and extracted in ways that are unsafe, that we would never put up with, that poison the ground and the water that people rely on to feed and nourish them. And so homelands become destroyed and unsafe and people have nowhere else to turn. So those things that we purchase and the things that we invest our time and our energy and our funds in, we look at how they made their way to us. We look at how, perhaps, coming from places where there is poor labor, employment, and payment practices, unsafe working conditions, again, that none of us would ever stand for, to virtual and actual slavery. And it's sometimes easier to think about and consider those when they are on the other side of the world. And it's more uncomfortable and disturbing when we start to dig a little deeper and find out that sometimes those practices happen much closer to home than we want. And so what does our Christian witness have to say to us? What does our faith require of us? And these are all of the things and more that we need to look at and take responsibility for and accountability for, whether it is through our church or through our government, through our society and culture, looking at the ways in which we treat people and comparing that with how God expects us to treat all of God's children. All of that we need to pay attention to in the context of our faith and what we proclaim to believe, how we say that we live out our faith. None of us is any better than the other. I certainly don't stand before you with any sort of righteousness, because we are all in this together. We all receive the same call from God. So back to the crowds pronouncing Hosanna to the King, the Son of David, those weary ones who were inspired and sustained by the words of a teacher. Were they the ones to stand calling for his cruc crucifixion mere days later? It's possible, and maybe not all of them, and maybe it's more complicated than that. It is hard to believe that in one moment lips would be shouting glory to God, and in the next, shouting, crucify him. And would we, would we find ourselves in that same position? I ask myself, would I? Would you? We hope and pray not. But we also know that sometimes that herd mentality and fear inspires us and moves us in different ways. Ways that we do not want. Ways that we would not expect. And the controlling power of oppression does things that we would not dream we would be capable of. So we pray as we move through this Holy Week that we are also sustained by the example of Christ, the love and the grace and the mercy of God. We pray that we may find the humility that allows us to follow in Christ's example 
and empty ourselves of that which does not give life. And in that emptiness, find the Holy Spirit filling us which that which, with that which does give life. We pray that we remember Jesus' words, that the last and the least of this world shall be first in the kingdom of heaven, and that the first and that the most important and the powerful and the rich shall be last, not cut out and not abandoned, not written off or out, but simply last, so that perhaps we can truly learn to love and act in that generosity and kindness with the grace and mercy that Jesus showed, to truly learn the humility with which Jesus led. Those words from another part of the Gospel, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or alone? Anywhere and everywhere, Jesus says. And so later this week, as we revisit the Last Supper Jesus shared with the disciples, as he washes their feet, he gives them that example and gives them the most important commandment. He tells them that they must love and that they must follow his example, that they must become like slaves to one another in their service. And this is the grace and the love that he exemplified for them and that he invited them to follow him. And it is that same grace and love with which he entered into Jerusalem. It is that same grace and love with which he left Jerusalem on his way to Golgotha and the cross. And it is that grace and love that sustains the weary. It is that grace and love that is given to you as a gift. And it is also required and asked of you to share with others so that God, working in and through you, may make that grace and love and mercy known to all, as it has been made known to you. So we stand with those waving palms, and we shout, Hosanna to the King of David. Hosanna to the Son. We shout, Hosanna, filled with hope. Hope for the weary, Hope for those on the outside. Hope for those who wish for nothing other than life. Hosanna. Hosanna to the King. Hosanna.